Thank you uh, for joining us today to discuss the President's fiscal year 2025 budget request for the Department of Interior. Nearly two-thirds of the state of Idaho consists of federal land, which means that land management decisions made by federal agencies like yours have a profound and direct impact on our state's economy and Idahoans who live, work, and recreate on or near federal lands. Indeed, most Idahoans interdict or interact with the department and its bureaus daily. The department, of this, uh, the department and this subcommittee also have the important responsibility of fulfilling our treaty and trust obligations to tribes. Addressing the greatest tribal needs including education, law enforcement, and tribal land management issues continue to be a top priority of this subcommittee under both Republican and Democratic chairs. And I'm sure newly elected Chairman Cole shares this sentiment. I've talked to him about it. <laughs> I appreciate your active involvement working with us and our American Indian and Alaska Native brothers and sisters to address these issues in the FY 2025 budget. In terms of discretionary resources, the President the President's request for fiscal year 25 asks for over $16 billion for the Department of Interior, an increase of $1.6 billion or 11 percent above the FY 2024 enacted level. Notice, notably, the budget proposes shifting more than $830 million from base discretionary to emergency funding for wildfire activities. As I said yesterday to the Chief of the Forest Service, I have serious concerns about repeating the budgetary gimmicks that uh, were just rectified by Congress in the 2024 bill. So while I may not agree with all the priorities in this budget proposal or the recent rulemaking rule put out by the Department, I appreciate that we can have a productive <laughs> conversation about the land management issues we are facing and the tools you need to manage our lands effectively and efficiently. My colleagues and I hope to cover a lot of ground with you today. Now I'd like to yield to my ranking member, Ms. Pingree, for her opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Secretary Holland, for being with us today to discuss the fiscal year 2025 budget request for the Department of Interior. Um, I continue to be so pleased that you bring your perspective to this position as the Secretary and uh, just always happy to work with you. Your budget continues to build on this administration's commitment to addressing climate crisis. It strengthens the federal government's response to wildland fire, and it ensures that we are upholding our treaty and trust obligations. As the steward of our federal lands, your agency faces significant climate-related challenges from drought, wildfire, floods, and invasive species. So I'm pleased to see continued investments to advance science and enhance conservation efforts. The budget also seeks to meet our responsibilities and legal obligations to protect Indian trust assets and resources and to provide direct services such as education, public safety, and justice. A total increase of $651 million is proposed for Indian Affairs with targeted investments to address missing and murdered indigenous people, continue the Secretary's boarding school initiative, and its comprehensive review of federal boarding school policies and to support native language revitalization. I believe these increases are appropriate and necessary. Secretary Holland, thank you again for appearing before us this morning. I appreciate your testimony and your answers to our questions. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Pingree. Uh, Secretary Holland, you may proceed with your opening statement. Your official uh, submitted <coughs> testimony will be included in the record. Yes, yes, thank you. Chair Simpson, Ranking Member Pingree, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Interior's fiscal year 2025 budget request. I appreciate all of the support the subcommittee and your staff have consistently shown the Department of the Interior. We appreciate that. I have especially enjoyed visiting so many of your home districts. Every trip informs my understanding of the issues important to the American people, the impact of the work that we do, and how our budget can support those interests. Our 2025 budget totals $18 billion in current authority. Of that amount, $16.4 billion is within the jurisdiction of the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. First, I want to highlight several important proposals. Permanent pay legislation and reforms for our wildland fire workforce, mandatory funding for future Indian water rights settlements, and reclassifying contract support costs and leasing payments to tribes from discretionary to mandatory funding starting in 2026. This administration has made a steadfast commitment to strengthen government-to-government -government relationships with tribal nations. We are doing so thanks to significant investments from Congress, which are helping address the deficiencies that decades of underfunding have created. I'm grateful to the members of the subcommittee for working on a bipartisan basis to champion tribal priorities. 
With a total request of $4.6 billion for Indian Affairs programs, this budget will address complex and difficult challenges such as the missing and murdered Indigenous Peoples Crisis, the legacy and continuing impacts of federal Indian boarding school policies, and native language revitalization. Public safety continues to be a top priority for tribal leaders across the country. The budget includes $651 million to support critical public safety needs across all of Indian country. We also request $1.5 billion for Indian education programs with strong investments in the day-to-day -day operations of schools. This funding is critical as we prepare the next generation of Indigenous Americans to lead their communities. Turning to wildland fire, we continue to see the devastating impacts they are having across the country. I want to thank the subcommittee for your bipartisan support for extending supplemental fire pay for another year. The 2025 budget invests in reforms, including $75 million to support permanent pay increases for federal and tribal wildland firefighters. Stewardship of our natural resources is a core mission for us. Interior manages about 20% of America's lands and is responsible for protection and recovery of more than 2,300 endangered and threatened species. Our request includes $2.8 billion in annual funding for conservation efforts that support key initiatives such as wildlife corridors and implementing the National Seed Strategy. I am proud of the proposal of $8 million for a mandatory funded tribal land acquisition program, a top priority for tribes as part of our implementation of the Land and Water Conservation Fund program. This proposal honors the role tribes play as stewards of the land and will help ensure they have resources to ensure healthy lands for future generations. The 2025 budget invests $189 million to continue the progress we have made in deploying clean energy, building a resilient domestic-based supply chain, and creating thousands of good-paying jobs. The demand for renewable energy has never been greater, and Interior is leading the way to a clean energy future. Regarding infrastructure, our request includes $2.7 billion to fund operations and maintenance for our more than 130,000 buildings and structures and 65,000 miles of public roads. In addition, there is $1.6 billion in mandatory funding available in 2025 through the Great American Outdoors Act Legacy Restoration Fund. We're currently executing three. 326 GOA-funded projects with 83 additional projects requested for 2025. <clears throat> we cannot address our major maintenance needs through annual appropriations alone. I look forward to working with Congress to reauthorize the GOA Legacy Restoration Fund. Overall, the President's budget request for Interior invests in programs to strengthen our nation for all Americans. This great work would not be possible without the dedication of career public servants at Interior. I look forward to our continued work together on these important issues. Thank you for your partnership and support for the important work of the department and its incredible employees. I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, let me start off. This is something you knew was going to come up. I was going to have to comment on. Uh, the proposal to build a 400 turbine wind generating facility in Idaho's Magic Valley has been met with almost unanimous opposition from local residents. These would be the largest wind turbines on land in the United States. They are taller than the Washington Monument. They're taller than the Seattle Space Needle, 400 of them. I have yet to talk to one Magic Valley resident who supports it. As the voice of my constituents, I have, I have been a very strong local opponent of the Lava Ridge Wind Project and have advocated for the Bureau of Land Management to listen to Idaho's concerns. To force the BLM to slow down and acknowledge the concerns of impacted communities, I included language in the 24 appropriation legislation stopping the project from moving forward until BLM consults with local elected official, officials and stakeholders on actions, uh, alternative actions, to reduce the impact to wildlife, cultural resources, and other assets. Can you walk me through what the agency has done since the enactment of the 2024 bill to adhere to the requirements of the Idaho wind provision? Uh, what elected officials have stakeholders uh, have you consulted with since March 9th, and what feedback and concerns have they shared with you, and how do you plan to incorporate those concerns before moving forward? Thank you for the question, Chairman, and um, appreciate also the conversation that we had yesterday on this issue. 
Um, so roughly 26 government-to-government -government consultation meetings with tribes have happened. We've had at least 19 meetings with county commissioners from Lincoln, Jerome, and Minidoka counties. 14 briefings for members of Congress or their staff, six meetings with local organizations, four meetings with grazing permittees and other members of the agricultural community, six public meetings on the draft environmental impact statement, numerous engagements with Japanese American community, and many more. Um, we appreciate your, um, your concern and your communication with us, and we're working to meet the direction um, uh, to conduct additional consultations with local elected officials and stakeholders. Uh, this issue is not completed yet. It is ongoing. Um, uh, there is still more conversations and, and work to be had. And we'll, we'll uh, obviously stay in touch with you as it moves forward. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the consultation with the local community. This goes without saying, but I expect BLM to listen to the concerns of Idahoans directly affected by the proposed uh, Lava Ridge Wind Project and give those concerns considerable weight in the development of the final EIS. Local officials, affected farmers, tribes, and the Japanese American community have raised serious concerns and their voices need to be heard. I support all of the I support an all of the above approach to energy development, but this administration cannot continue to unilaterally ram through renewable energy projects with no local support and with no forethought uh, for their impact on these important land uses. The Lava Ridge Wind Project is out of touch with Idahoans, and I remain committed to taking significant actions to put the people of Idaho first. So thank you for that. Uh, Sage Grass Management Plan. Since 2015, I've included language in the annual interior spending bills prohibiting the greater sage grouse from being listed under the Endangered Species Act, and Congress has directed BLM to work collaborative, collaboratively with states, private landowners, and other stakeholders to conserve sage grouse habitat. In 2015, Idaho adopted the collaborative, uh, collaboratively developed Idaho Sage Grouse Management Plan as the state's official policy for sage grouse management. The original plan has been uh, updated to provide a balanced approach for the species and the people of Idaho. Since 2015, the state of Idaho has spent over $5 million to increase data on sage grouse populations and enhance over 76,000 acres of sage grouse habitat. These efforts aren't unique to Idaho. Other states have worked just as tirelessly and dedicated significant state resources to avoid the need for federal rulemaking. Despite these efforts, on March 15, 2024, the department published proposals regarding uh, greater sage-grouse habitat. The threat of an ESA listing and overly restrictive federal land use plans undermines the collaborative work being done to manage sage-grouse habitats at the local level by the individuals who work, live, and recreate on Idaho's land. More so, the proposals will have drastic effects on grazing permittees, resource development, timber harvesters, uh, recreators whose livelihoods depend on responsible management of our federal lands. Question one. And let me tell you how we got here, because people think that I don't care about sage grouse and maintaining the, uh, the fact that I don't want them to go to extinct or anything else. When this became an issue, uh, former Secretary Salazar came to me and said, you know, what we need to do is have the states develop management plans. And so all of the states, the 11 Western states, put together these collaborative efforts that included uh, federal land management agencies, local ranchers, recreationists, others, stakeholders. And they came up with what they believed to be good state management plans that they could live with. And uh, Idaho's plan was actually uh, rated as co-equal with the BLM's plan. And we all know that you're not going to save, save sage-grass habitat if you don't get private landowners involved, because a lot of the habitat is on private lands. And so they had an interest in this, and they worked very hard with, with the state and the committee to, to accomplish that. And now we come in, and I will tell you that if, and the reason I include language to not list them is that if all of a sudden you listed them, those people that participated in developing a sage grouse management plan are going to say, I'm done, I'm out of here. And that's going to hurt trying to, to save sage grouse habitat and stuff. So 
That's my concern with listing, and that's why I put the language in there that I have had. Uh, is the department's position that a one-size-fits-all approach to conservation outweighs unique plans that consider and incorporate the specific threats uh, to that locality? And can you explain the department's process leading to the necessity for this, probal, uh, this proposal? And what is the timing and plan for this proposal? Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, it's been my experience with the department that we value very much uh, local uh, input, state input, we, we feel those folks know better. They live on the land and they know uh, things that we don't know. So we are transparent and very collaborative when it comes to that. Uh, with respect to the plan itself, we published a draft EIS for the Greater Sage Grouse Plan in March. The comment period ends this June, June 13th. We aim to complete a revised plan amendments by the end of this year, 2024. We're working with partners with BLM identified specific greater sage grouse, grouse plan decisions to consider amending to incorporate new science. All other existing decisions remain in the plans unchanged and DOI remains committed to reversing the downward trend in greater sage grouse populations on BLM managed lands. Let me suggest that uh, when you, when this comes out, you need to incorporate uh, not just the comments and stuff from, and listen to the comments from, from people, but get together a working group and say, okay, how are we going to implement that if, if that's the, the way we're moving forward on this and what's the impacts going to be and what are the impacts uh, on onshore energy production and mineral development? Because you know one of the, one of the most critical problems we're facing this, in this country right now is the supply chain for critical minerals that we get from our adversaries, frankly. Uh, and uh, we have those resources in this country. Most of them are on public lands, though. But trying to get access to those resources is sometimes very, very difficult. All of those things need to be taken into consideration if you're going to change the, the sage grouse plan. But it, as I said, my biggest concern is that it involves local people because you're not going to save sage grouse habitat if you don't have private landowners involved in it. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Pingree. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I brought this up in my uh, opening remarks, but I want to just talk a little bit about tribal climate resilience funding. Um, I, I guess we know tribal climate resilience needs are as diverse as climate impacts seem to affect each tribe differently. I know a little bit about the struggles of the Passamaquoddy Indian tribe in Maine who are confronting climate-related environmental threats such as sea level rise, which impor um, imperils important cultural sites, tribal member housing, including an elderly housing facility as well as wastewater treatment plant. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Inflation Reduction Act, an annual tribal climate resilience appropriated fund, provide about $120 million a year for tribal climate adaptation and resilience projects. So can you tell us sort of the nationwide need for these funds, specifically in the lower 48, and how many tribes are applying right now? Um, thank you very much for the question. And um, yes, it is um, that's definitely an issue, and we are paying attention to it. Um, so thank you. We've had, uh, of course, a very strong response from Indian country. We've received 166 proposals from tribes, totaling over $150 million for fiscal year 2023 funded solicitation, and recently announced the $120 million in awards for 146 projects for 102 tribes and nine tribal organizations. Um, and it, we, it's historically high funding with the help of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Are you working with some of the other federal agencies to try to leverage more funds or see how we can enhance the amount of money available? Pretty much everything we do with respect to this issue uh, and tribes is an all of government approach. That's the direction from President Biden. So uh, yes, we are, we are absolutely um, uh, working to make sure that we're doing this Great. in a concerted effort. Um, do you have an estimate of the universe of need for funds to address the impacts of climate change on tribes? And are you, how are you guys strategizing about funding once the uh, infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act funding runs out, which well, changed things a lot? Yes, of course. And, and as time goes on, things um, seemingly get somewhat worse with sea level rise and the like. Um, 
but we we're going to keep an eye on it we're and and work to fill the need as we see fit um, but certainly that is a priority for us and it's a priority for tribes one of the things that I feel very confident about is that we are um, making sure that tribes are leading their efforts themselves we don't want to tell them what to do but they will tell us what to do um, and with respect to other the other federal agencies it's FEMA and CEQ um, who will help us identify other resources the 2025 budget also includes 49 million dollars with six million dollar increase for tribal adaptation and relocation planning grants great well thank you for that I know um, you know, we're all anxious to work with you going forward because it seems like just just what I've ascertained from one tribe in my state that the need is significant. And as I said, we weren't even talking about Alaska when we talk about that, and that that's just another big pool. Can I ask one more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just one more other question right now. Um, last week, Acadia National Park announced that the park will be receiving 950 thousand in funding from the Inflation Reduction Act to create a model for addressing climate change vulnerabilities of coastal coastal archaeological sites, collections, landscapes, and ethnographic resources, something we, we've, we have a lot of in Maine, including in my own community. Um, Acadia will be using the two-eyed seeing model to meaningfully integrate indigenous knowledge with Western science. The project will build on 15 years of consultation at Acadia National Park, St. Croix International, uh, Island International Historic Site, and Roosevelt Camp Campobello International Park with the Wabanaki tribes. This is just one example of the amazing work the, the Inflation Reduction Funding will support to prepare parks across the country to be resilient to climate change. The National Park Service just announced projects to be funded by the full $195 million. So could you just tell me, I know a little bit about what's going on in my own state, but I'd like to know what um, other types of work are going on um, and how the funding will work, support the work across the park system. We have been um, extremely proud of the work we've been able to do with tribes. I appreciate you mentioning indigenous knowledge. We believe very strongly that that is science that we all need to pay attention to, and it is really helping us to steward these lands. Uh, tr our tribal co-stewardship agreements across the country, uh, we've signed probably 200 of those, and there's um, um, probably 60 more um, that, are, that we're working on. To ensure that we are uh, that we're not missing anything, because tribes have the experience. Um, more, uh, and as you know, um, yes, more than one third of coastal parks are at significant risk from sea level rise, coastal erosion, and storm surge that's happening um, on all of our coasts. Uh, the NPS budget includes four million dollars for additional climate vulnerability studies and 2.5 million for climate-related natural resource projects at the parks. Uh, both, in, both of those investments could help uh, the National Park Service make progress in addressing climate resiliency. Uh, we'll keep our eyes on that and continue to work as needed and certainly bring tribes into the fold when it comes to um, how we steward those lands. Great. Thank you so much for that work. Um, I'll yield, yield back, Mr. Chair. Yeah, coming in loud, loud and clear. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary. I appreciate that uh, that you're with us here today. Um, under your watch, on September 16th, 2022, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a rule that included a ban on traditional ammunition and later took additional steps to further ban traditional am ammunition. What scientific evidence was used to support the 2022 final rule to put a ban on traditional ammunition and subsequent actions? Thank you very much, Congressman, for the question. And um, so I can start out by saying that the Fish and Wildlife Service is taking a measured approach to evaluate the use of lead on refuge areas. Um, committed in 2022-23 Hunt Fish Rule to consider the future of lead use based on the large number of public comments received on the issue. Um, we are, um, of course, it's our job to, um, to steward our, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service to steward our national wildlife refuges and um, we are just 
making sure that we're doing that in a responsible way. So no scientific research is what I think I heard your answer to be. We are, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, is, I mean, yes, we have scientists all over the place studying these things, Congressman. And um, we, and I believe so that's So is there a specific report that you can point this committee to that caused you to take that action? I would be very happy to uh, get back with the Fish and Wildlife Service and make sure that they can give you the data that they used in evaluating I, this I issue. would be very interested to hear that from uh, an organization that is all about uh, science and, and, and studies. So. Uh, can we count on your word to provide that data to this committee? We'll be happy to get in touch with your staff as soon as this uh, right. hearing is over, sir. Thank you. All right, I, I appreciate it. Uh, next question, uh, Secretary Holland. Uh, just yes or no, do you feel that it's prudent to provide funding to localities that intentionally violate federal law? I'm not quite, I don't understand <laughs> what the question is. Real, real, real simple. Uh, should we provide funding to uh, entities or localities that intentionally violate federal law? Are, are, could you be more specific, sir? Yeah, I sure. Do you feel like it's prudent to provide funding to localities that intentionally violate federal law, any federal law? I, I, I couldn't answer that question unless I knew the issue, the specific issue. I mean, there's a whole host of federal about. laws. Would but, you not expect? But local? of course, we follow the law, Congressman. We, the Department of the Interior, follows, follows the law in uh, everything we do. And so, would you expect that localities would also follow federal law? I expect every American to follow the laws. All right. Thank you for that. So. With that, do you feel the Department of Interior should continue to provide grant funds to tribes that legalize marijuana against federal law? It, I suppose it depends, Congressman, on what the grant is used for. If it's a grant to uh, help them uh, combat sea level rise and move uh, I'm, their I'm, my, my question was in regards. One issue. My, my question was in, in regards to uh, um, legalizing marijuana. On, on tribal lands. Do you think that we should continue to fund uh, tribal uh, entities that break federal law by legalizing uh, marijuana? I would imagine if tribes are requesting funds and they fill out the applicable um, uh, paperwork and grant and make their grant proposals that they will be um, reviewed and um, decided upon. In so, so what other federal laws would uh, you be in support of local entities breaking? Congressman, I'm not in support of anyone breaking any laws. Okay, and so you would not, I, I, I think by virtue of that answer, you would not, you would not uh, condone uh, continuing to fund uh, local entities that break federal law. And I would also point, um, Congressman, that the uh, Justice Department is the department to handle any issues of law breaking, and um, if we're happy to move to no. point that in that direction if you'd like us to. I'd, I'd, I'd just like to interject and uh, l let you know my opinion on, on the topic. Uh, there have been several studies from the National Institute on Drug Abuse that have linked heavy marijuana use to lower income, greater welfare dependence, unemployment, criminal behavior, and lower life satisfaction. Uh, as our nation continues to face an unprecedented drug crisis and mental health crisis, I think it's more imperative than ever that federal agencies commit to upholding uh, federal law and protecting our communities against the hazards that are caused by marijuana production and sale. Um, next question. I don't, I don't know if I'm on a clock or not, uh, Ms., Mr. Chair. Uh, the President's budget includes almost $32 million in cuts to uh, the payment in lieu of taxes funding and request to transfer uh, those funds from general provisions which would provide full funding to an appropriations account. Can you explain why? 
Um, thank you. Yes, we will. If you give us just one second, please. Um, so I beg your pardon, Congressman, would you just repeat the question? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'd be happy to. The President's budget includes almost $32 million in cuts to PILT funding and requests to transfer PILT from general provisions, which would provide full funding to an appropriations account. And I was just curious to know uh, why is that? Um, so I, what I can say is that we remain committed to PILT uh, while balancing the needs in a constrained budget environment. The budget first funds ongoing operations and services. Interior provides directly to the public. And uh, the budget takes reductions in several grant and payment programs, including PILT. The 2025 request will likely be short of the final formula-driven authorized level. Um, it isn't unusual or unprecedented for the request or even CBO scoring to fall short of the final payment. So we'll continue to do the best that we possibly can. Thank, thank you, Madam Secretary. I appreciate that. I'd just also like to interject that the Department of Interior's constant fluctuation in funding accounts and levels means that counties with a large federal acreage, like most of those in my district in western North Carolina, are continually facing uncertainty and stuck in ongoing funding battles. Uh, I'm particularly interested in reevaluating the complex PILT funding formula and providing greater certainty to communities to better eliminate the negative fiscal impacts that federally owned land creates. Uh, you. Would you commit to working with me on this as we look forward to the 2025 appropriations? Um, we are happy, of course, to be in touch with you, Congressman, if you would like us to. Um, um, and so, yes. All right. We'll do our Thank best. Thank you very much. I do have a couple of other questions, but uh, ma maybe we'll get another round. Thanks. Thank you. And I will tell you that, uh, as is often said, the President, whether it's Republican or Democrat, proposes, Congress disposes, <laughs> we will not end up with a budget that reduces funding for PILT. He has 83 percent federal land in his district. I have 60, 66 percent in mine. I don't see the support for that. But there's also, a, there's also a habit that I've noticed with, again, Republican governors, Democratic governors, or presidents, either one, is that they sometimes reduce the funding for things in their budget proposal that they know are important to Congress because they know we're not going to allow that to happen. So then they can put resources into something else. So that's a game that's always played. Anyway, Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Chairman, and um, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Uh, um, and I appreciate uh, the ranking member mentioning the impact of climate change on, on tribes. The, a present bu president's budget includes a uh, little south of 49 million for the tribal climate resilience program, including an increase of 4 million for climate relocation grants. That really matters in my neck of the woods. Um, Madam Secretary, you came and visited my district. If you, if any of the members of the committee want to Google uh, Tahola, which is the lower village of the Quinault Indian Nation, and flooding, you will actually see photographs of people canoeing through their village, through the streets of their village. Um, I sat there with the president, former president of the Quinault Indian Nation, and she said, you know, when I was a kid, the ocean was a football field's length away, and she said, now it's our front porch. And every time there's a severe storm, their seawall breaches, and they just fill up like a bowl. And unfortunately, that's the case for a whole bunch of the tribes in my neck of the woods that are trying to move to higher ground. And some of this costs money for the Quinault relocation project alone. We're talking a $400 million project to move a village out of harm's way. But funding isn't the only challenge. We also have this uh, uh, sort of complex jumble of potential resources and programs across the federal government, each with its own set of rules and regulatory strings and cost shares and deadlines and other administrative processes that kind of make it difficult and sometimes impossible for uh, tribes to plan and to execute a project. Um, I really appreciate the chairman. He has um, partnered me with me on a bill called the Terra Act. 
that would establish an interag interagency framework under your department, Madam Secretary, for just coordinating the prevention and mitigation and relocation efforts of tribes. And the idea under this bill would be to work directly with Department of Interior to develop a single comprehensive plan that would integrate and streamline some of these federal resources and programs across the federal government. And I think that really matters because, you know, time is of the essence. And we're spending, you know, these conflicting rules and deadlines and things like that are not helpful to the folks who just need some help. So we'd love to just get your thoughts on how that streamlined authority that exists under the proposal that we've introduced could help your agency and could help tribes actually develop and ex execute a comprehensive and coordinated plan for climate-driven relocation. And I want to just invite if there are other resources or approaches that you're pursuing um, toward that end. Thank you so much for the question. And um, yes, we talked about this the other day. In fact, uh, it sounds like a very exciting idea. And of course, if we can coordinate um, and streamline things, that's a win for tribes in this case. So um, we uh, appreciate that um, as well as a um, community driven uh, projects. Um, you know, when we use the word relocation, it kind of, it's a little buzzword that mm. gives me a little. Um, you know, bad feeling inside when we think about the other relocation for tribes um, from um, years past. Um, this is a, this is, these ideas for tribes to relocate uh, come from within their communities and so we want to be as supportive as we possibly can. Um, uh, of course, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, um, your staff is welcome to call our staff, have a conversation about the bill. Uh, to find out details, and we're more than happy to work with you as we move forward. I think when folks get together and talk about things, they have they bring ideas to the table that they didn't realize until um, they're there. So um, we'd love to have more conversations about it with Thank you. you. Thank you. And I know my team's been in touch with yours and appreciate the, the guidance as we work to introduce that bill together. Um, I know we've got a lot of folks with a lot of questions. I just want to mention um, in closing a bill that Senator Warren and I introduced last Congress that we plan to introduce this Congress. It's called the Honoring Promise to Native Nations Act. Um, and it stems from the report from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights that lays out what has really been a persistent underfunding, uh, a chronic underfunding uh, of for issues faced by Indian country um, on all sorts of topics. But the federal government's failure to meet its trust and treaty obligations is significant, and we're going to be working to introduce that bill this Congress, and I'd just love to stay in touch with you and your team uh, on that front. I know that's something that you worked on when you were a member of this body, and um, we're continuing to work on it. Yes, th thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yes, that report is heartbreaking and and continues to be timely if if people haven't read it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Amadeus or er, Amity. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, welcome back to your old neighborhood. Um, I, I, I want to start with personnel uh, because it kind of um, in my district and I think other ones. We struggle with with meeting mission for the Bureau of Land Management when we talk about filling up those those district offices, those field offices. People there can't afford to, to take a job with BLM because they can't afford to live in the communities where those offices are located. And so when we go and say, what the heck's going on with the permitting, with the range stuff, with the whatever, and it's like they're doing the best they can. Um, and, and I will say that none of them are going, oh, we haven't got enough people. We'll check back with you in a few years, although occasionally that happens over a countertop. But, and, and I want to say you've got a great team in Nevada. They're transparent, um, and, and, and I value that in terms of when we're trying to solve problems. But as I look through this budget proposal, and you've got your folks here on either side, I, I look at what's going on there, and, and we've talked about this for a few years now before you were here. Um, and it's like, what are we doing? so that we can fill those positions and that we can pay those people a wage which allows them to live in the communities in which those jobs exist because they are not being filled. And so when I circulate amongst my districts, district offices, and, and talk to the field office managers, and it's like, well, 
not, not, that the, not that the process to go through to get hired is crisp, different topic, but it's like nobody wants a job for what it pays. They're taking ones that, can you point me where in this budget proposal we're doing something about that? Because I don't see anything. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff in there, but here's where we're going to try to throw a dart at the problem of filling empty positions because BLM personnel can't, and, and, and it's, not, it's not the bottom GS stuff. I, I mean, when you talk about district managers and stuff, it's like, geez. I mean, it's getting tight, and, and that's not your fault. But I see the agency over the last 10 years doing nothing. Please tell me how full of you know what I am doing nothing to address that. There is no leadership message coming through the budget process to these people, in my opinion. Thank you very much for the question, and thank you for recognizing um, the issue about housing and so forth. That's, that is um, something that um, we care deeply about or working to get our arms around. Um, Let's see. Uh, we appreciate also the committee efforts to avoid significant staffing impacts in 2024. Um, what I could say is that DOI's work is staff intensive. Um, it's public facing in 2,400 locations. Um, uh, it, staffing went up last year. Uh, now we're close to 60. It went up by 2%, so we're able to hire 2%. Um, 2% closer to where we needed to be. We're close to 63,000 FTs. That's department-wide. I know you're particularly speaking of the BLM. Um, um, and um, so I, I wish I could tell you specifically what you need to know. We'll have to follow up with you on that. However, uh, we appreciate knowing your concern and we'll zero in on something that you can get your arms around. Um, but we we know that um, we we know that we need to make sure we're paying attention. Well, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, full disclosure, um, I will be trying in a responsible manner through this committee's work process to as as we go through that budget stuff to say is, is there some way we can pr provide a proposed solution. I will be contacting your folks so that it's not like, hey, nobody made you a doctor and your cure stinks or something like that. But um, I, I just think the status quo has been the status quo for too long, and I don't see anything changing. So, so thank you for that. N now I, I want to talk a little bit about fuels because it touches on a whole bunch of other things. And I know there was some money for fuels in, in one of the President's Infrastructure Act or something like that. But as, as we talk about sage hen and we talk about fire suppression and how we pay those folks and all that other sort of stuff i'm looking at what we're doing in blm for fuels reduction as as a regular thing because the infrastructure act money isn't ongoing it will run out and so as we talk about do we really care about about greater sage grouse or by state or any of that stuff and we're sitting here going and you've said and i think it's accurate Hey, the, the, the populations continue to drop. And everybody else has said, since we're talking about science, number one threat, fire. I appreciate once it's burning, we got to do what we need to do to put it out and, and rehab it. But stopping it from, from being hundreds of thousands of acres, especially in the West, um, because I can tell you right now, it's not a real big prediction. Um, if we continue to judge just by how many acres we lose to fire, then the whole Sachin thing's a disaster. And, and so I would like to see a real commitment, especially in the context of Sachin country, to if we really care about that species, we need to do something to make those fires smaller. And fuels is, is the thing. We won't get into grazing and all that other sort of stuff. And, and I don't see a real big thing other than the infrastructure piece where there's there because, and you say, well, yeah, 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 whatever. Why do we care about that? We care about that because the chairman intimated in Idaho that's a big deal. I'll tell you what, if you list the greater sage grouse in my neck of the woods, hmm. you've shut the state down. You own, you don't own, but the federal government owns north of 80% of it. Grazing, mining, recreation, all that stuff. It's like, up oh, endangered species, time out. It's like, have a nice day with anything resembling multiple use 
Oh, by the way, you can still hunt sage hen in Nevada. Don't, they're not a the threat for me because I can't shoot very well. I'll, I could shoot at them all day long and not hurt one. But um, um, it's my time, please. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, it just covers so many things in the West. And, and when we look at what we went through with Secretary Jewell to create this stuff, it really seems to me like what's, what's being going on now is both sides of your mouth. There was a big hug fest in Denver, and state governors were there. Everybody loved everybody. It's like, oh, by the way, we're taking this back. It, it just, none of it connects for me, and, and I'm concerned about it. So anything on fuels? Congressman, yes. And I'll if, end my rant with if that. I, well, I appreciate it, and of course, we, um, we understand and, and thank you for um, speaking so frankly with us. Um, as far as fuel goes, $288 million for fuels, that's $74 million above 2024 enacted, um, uh, and it includes $25 million in base supplemental pay increases for firefighters together with bill funds uh, that will treat 1.8 million acres in 2025. Um, uh, and I appreciate that. And I would just say this. If we're really worried about th that species, th th then maybe that ought to have some targeting language in it. In other Thank words, you. to avoid a listing. Thank you. Um, or, or at least do what we can. Thank and, you. And the other side of that is rehab language because if, if we don't talk about, if we don't start at Fish and Wildlife about talking about what we're doing to rehab and put that in, if we just look at what's burned, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the West. Yes, I understand. And we do want to, we don't want to have fire, big, huge fires that kill everything. We, we understand the need to, uh, to prevent them in the first place. And especially in light of climate change, it becomes uh, a, a super important issue. Thank you. And if there's anything to yield back, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Oh, well, you passed that a long time ago. No. <laughs> Mr. Zinke. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Secretary, welcome back. You know, as a secretary, obviously, you get used to big issues like public lands and access and climate change and et cetera, et cetera, than big issues. But occasionally, smaller issues come up. And one small issue uh, has come up in my district, which is very concerning to me, and it, it, may, it may tip other concerns. So, Madam Secretary, are you aware of a local minor baseball team called the Glacier uh, Riders, Range Riders? Uh, well, are you aware that your department's litigation uh, over the Glacier Range Riders logo. Are you aware that, that, that your department is litigating over their logo? Congressman, uh, I believe the name changes uh, go to the Board of Geographic Names. Uh, nothing to do with name change. It's a logo. Are, are you aware that your department is in litigation? Uh, I yes or no, ma'am? No, I'm not aware. Okay. All right. Are you aware that the arrowhead is oftentimes used as a logo and many organizations? No, I'm not aware of that. Well, let me, let me give you an example of an arrowhead being used in logos for those Kansas City guys. Uh, this is a, a numerous, and there are high schools, et cetera, et cetera, that all uh, use the logos. So my point is gathering, uh, have you also uh, understand that the government patent office uh, has twice ruled against your department on that the glacier riders uh, do not violate the patent? So are, are you aware of that? And, and yes or no, and I would I assume it would be no, I don't want to answer for you. Congressman, I am, just to be clear, I'm not aware of anything okay. with the range riders. Well, and this is the problem as, as a secretary, uh, because sometimes a large department uh, does harm to local entities, like the baseball team, and I'll go further. Uh, I'm going to read a missive from your attorneys sent to the baseball team after the U.S. Patent Office said twice that it's not a violation of the logo. So what you demanded was a sample of each label, tag, sticker, container, package, box, 
packaging insert, point of sale display, and brochure ever used, sold to be considered for use or sale, bearing the Range Riders logo. To be clear, the request would also cover, cover production of each and every item sold, contemplated for sale as well as packaging. Do you think that that is a reasonable thing to ask of a Glacier Minor League Range Riders baseball team? Congressman, I am not allowed to comment on ongoing litigation. Well, I'm allowed to comment on this, is that your budget has requested more funds, significantly more funds. And yet that action has resulted in at least $500,000 of expenses to a minor league team that's just trying to throw a pitch. But when you ask me for more money, and yet you prioritize this, I'm going to question it. And it's my right and my duty as a congressman to question it. So uh, now I sit on appropriations, and I'm not being hard on you, I'm being, I'm being serious. I'll sit on appropriations, and that budget's going to be scrutinized. Lastly, our discussion, secondly, over climate change. Uh, you have pointed out that you use science. And when I was secretary, I had the honor of making sure my director of the USGS was an astronaut and had a PhD in geology. So you talk about sea level change in science. Have you ever read the multi-agency Department of Interior climate change report dated 2017? In, no, I haven't. I, no. Madam Secretary, I would suggest you read that Thank because you. it came from your department. And in that, have you ever heard the term glacial isostatic adjustment? I have not. Okay. So glacial isostatic adjustment on the East Coast is because we had glaciers large, thick, heavy glaciers on the plate to the north in Maine, all the way down to Jersey. So when that plate moves and you have the glaciers on it and the glaciers are removed over time, there's an isostatic adjustment. So if you read that report, it would have talked about it. It also would have talked about sea level rise versus depression. And I know you're probably not aware, but the, the sea level rise fully compensated for also the shift, the sinking, is about one millimeter a year. That would be in the report. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Elke. Thank you, Chairman Simpson and uh, Madam Secretary for being here. I'll get right to the, uh, the questions. Over the last several decades, the Gulf of Mexico has been a multi-use basin. However, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management recently published its Notice of Availability of the Area Identification, or Area ID, for the proposed Gulf of Mexico lease sales 262, 263, and 264, and is already potentially excluding blocks for the not yet finalized Gulf of Mexico Rice's Whale critical habitat, potential wind energy area blocks, sand sediment resources area blocks and topographic blocks. This signals a move away from multiple use and instead looks to be arbitrarily excluding areas from potential oil and gas lease sales, which is unprecedented, never happened before until now. So what is different now to push DOI to move away from multiple use? Um, Congressman, thank you for the question. And uh, we do have a multiple use mandate for our public lands and that's what we do. Okay. Why is DOI then moving to exclude the proposed rice as well critical habitat area even though that critical habitat has not yet been finalized? I, um, I'm happy to get back with you on that specific question, Congressman, um, if you were seeking uh, data or something of that nature, but I will say that um, we are very careful about uh, how we are moving our clean energy um, transition forward. And um, I also want to say that with respect to 
uh, offshore wind. Um, we have very a, a large number of conversations uh, with stakeholders, and um, we we absolutely um, speak with many people before we make any decisions of that kind. Okay. Well, with the rice as well critical habitat area, the ruling has to be made before you can block it. If you block it before the ruling is made, then that's definitely not going off the science. And to do so preemptively shows a bias against oil and gas production in that area, barring none, because you just want to. So I'd urge caution in blocking that area before the ruling has come out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Following a court decision, the BOEM was required to restore the six million acres that it had initially excluded from lease sale 261 after claiming those acres needed to be excluded due to potential impacts to the rice's whale. Inexplicably, BOEM made this decision again before the critical ha habitat determination was finalized. Uh, are you going to continue with this or is this mistake going to be made again? Because this is a mistake. You can't do it before it's been finalized. So it's, it's basically the same question asked a different way. So are you going to continue with that before it's been finalized? Congressman, I apologize. I'm very, we're happy to get back with your okay. office as soon as um, um, I'd I appreciate have that. a moment and sure, answer sure. that specific question You only question have 8 billion you. topics that you have to cover, yeah, so yeah. I don't expect you to have a, a, a memory of those, but I would like to get those answers. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll, we'll be happy to okay. contact you. Okay. Well, let's move on to the, and one last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the five-year Outer Continental Shelf leasing program issued by the Biden administration has the fewest lease sales scheduled in the history of five-year programs dating back to the 1980s, and 2024 will be the first year since 1965 without an offshore lease sale. So with offshore production accounting for 15% of U.S. oil production in a time where the world is going to need all of ours, all of our energy production, do you think it's important to continue offshore production? Congressman, as, as you know, we do follow the law in, in all of these issues. I will say that uh, with respect to the National OCS program, three lease sales in the plan have the greatest resource potential and net benefits with the least potentially significant impacts and costs to society. Um, uh, let's see, proposed schedule will best meet national energy needs for the next five years, and it meets all of the Inflation Reduction Act requirements. Uh, that Congress put on us. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, U.S. production on public lands and waters is a, at an all-time high uh, currently. Ah, that doesn't really matter. What I'm asking about is 262, and I know you're getting a lot of papers from right back, so let's summarize this in one way. Mm -hmm. Will you commit to a lease sale for 262? Congressman, we are going to um, we are going to uh, operate within the law, and I get to yes. Come on, let me hear I, yes. I, I, Commit I, to the lease sale that's required on the five-year plan. We we are going to do everything that we're required to do with respect to our energy needs in this country. I know Congress uh, it has mandated us to to have lease sales. We're going to have those. Very well. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. Sounds like a yes to me. <laughs> uh, Madam Secretary, last month the administration released a decision reversing the Critical Endangered Species Act reforms implemented during the previous administration, reinstating the blanket 4D rule, which automatically provides for endangered, endangered level protections to species listed only as threatened. I have heard concerns uh, that this change will lead us to less flexibility for landowners and stakeholders and could tie up landowners in mountains of unnecessary bureaucratic red tape, ceasing any economic progress for rural communities across the United States. Can you walk us through what these changes are and how they will improve the Endangered Species Act and what resources has the department provided uh, to private landowners to understand this uh, this? Uh, rule making and did the department consider the negative impacts related to economic development associated with this rule making? Thank you, Congressman. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service finalized three rules to restore protections for species in their habitats, strengthen processes for listing, designating critical habitats, and consultation with federal partners. The changes may do not further impede on private landowners' rights. Rules are not expected to change the number or frequency of listings and delistings, the total amount or area of critical habitat designated, the rate or frequency of Section 7 consultation, or the resulting conclusion. 
The rules do provide clear, straightforward regulations to recover listed species and protect critical habitats for Section 7 consultations, species classification and critical habitat. And there is a separate rule finalized to encourage participation in voluntary collaborative conservation with resource managers and landowners. I know that we are always in contact with, um, with stakeholders whenever any of these issues come to light. So I want to assure you that we operate in a transparent manner and, and certainly do um, welcome those comments. I appreciate that, but there's a difference in being in contact with, with local stakeholders and listening to local stakeholders. We there's listen. Two difference. We do <laughs> listen. And uh, because they have some, ought to have some input in this, but it sounds to me like it's not going to change anything. If it's not going to change anything, then why the hell are we doing it? Thank you, Congressman. We, uh, we're, we're doing it because I think it will make things better. Okay, well, clarify, we'll have... Clarify some certain things. We'll have a, we'll have a discussion on this later. Uh, and Southeast Idaho is, is the home to one of the world's most significant phosphate reserves, and these reserves have been in production for many years. One such mine, the Caldwell Canyon Mine, is currently under review by the Bureau of Land Management. This mine is of great importance not only to my constituents and our state's economy, but also to the country's agricultural industry. When complete, Caldwell... Canyon Mine will provide the only source of phosphate in the United States, which is critically important to our nation and the world's food supply. The BLM has been diligently working on this project for many years. When can we expect the BLM to issue an updated record of decision related to this project? And I welcome hearing any related updates you can share. Thank you very much, Chairman. And. Um, so the new EIS will address the issues identified by the court, and the BLM plans to have a draft EIS available for public review later this year. Uh, this schedule could result in a final EIS and ROD in early 2025. Does that answer your question, yep. sir? Thank you. Uh, one last question for me here uh, before I have to step out and do a another hearing for a minute upstairs. I have to uh, go to it for just a minute. I continue to hear from tribes across the country about law enforcement issues on Indian reservations. Whether it's jurisdictional issues, a lack of law, uh, police force, or slow response times, this is a serious issue. Violent crimes continue to rise and lethal drugs like fentanyl run rampant in Indian country. And of course the drug cartels choose reservations because they know there's not a lot of law enforcement out there. While we work to protect law enforcement accounts during the tough budget year of 2024, I know it's not enough and more work needs to be done. I understand that this is, uh, that this is a continued joint effort across many federal agencies, but what is DOI doing to support tribal law enforcement, bridge gaps in coverage, and hire and retain police forces? And what else can DOI and this com subcommittee in particular do to keep tribal communities safe? Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you. We, I know we spoke about this yesterday, and I appreciate your concern. And, um, of course, um, I'm, we recognize that there's an issue. Um, we want to make sure that we can hire folks. Some of these um, Indian uh, tribal nations are very rural. Um, we want to make sure that we can hire local folks so they can stay in their communities. That's one issue. Um, sometimes we hire them and then they get yep. um, swept away by another agency. Um, I am more than happy to have Joan, um, who has works on this issue uh, day in and day out, um, answer some specific questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, Joan, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, it is a high priority for us, and the request gives $651 million for public safety and justice programs, which is a $96 million increase. So we need the strong increase. We have a long way to go to address these needs in Indian country. And um, without this budget, we'd not be able to fund roughly 222 federal tribal officers or add 120 federal and tribal positions to improve the operations of BIA-funded detention and correction facilities. And we wouldn't be able to reduce, uh, we, it would reduce other programs uh, to meet court-ordered requirements to a Navajo courts and delay needed maintenance and operating requirements at tribal courts. So very important that we get this funding. Thank you. I, I agree. And it is, uh, I've talked to a lot of tribes, and 
I go to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation and talk to them, their police officers have to go through the same training as every other police officer does in the, in the state. And the problem is, is they come back, they, they work on the reservation, and then Blackfoot, where I grew up, is 20 miles north, and Pocatello is 20 miles south of there, or actually it's only 12 miles east direction, and uh, they get uh, the cities hire them and pay them a lot more than the tribes can afford to pay them, and so it's like a training ground for these, for these officers and so forth. And we have some issues about cross-jurisdiction and memorandums of understandings with counties and all, all sorts of stuff. But every time I talk to one of the tribes about the issue of murdered and uh, missing indigenous women, they will almost always say, we don't have enough law enforcement officers. And you got a reservation the size of Rhode Island or Delaware or whatever, and you got seven offers, officers patrolling it for 24 hours a day. You get a domestic violence call. It might be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours before you can get there. By then, the domestic violence is done. We've got to focus on this if we're going to ever address this issue. Do you know that we lose 6,000 indigenous women to the murdering, murdered and missing category every year? If this happened with any other subpopulation within our, within our country, there would be public outrage. But nobody really knows this. I only learned about it by I was watching a TV program one night. Came up and they discussed it with this uh, lady from the Nez Perce tribe that is uh, actively involved. And we're going to hold a briefing on this uh, this year on this subcommittee. And part of it is also getting the FBI involved because the FBI does, has jurisdiction on, a lot, on tribal lands and so forth. And sometimes it's hard to find an FBI agent. So uh, we, need to, we need to focus our attention on this, and we're going to definitely do that this year. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and I've got to step out for just a minute. And Mr. Zinke will take over for me for a few minutes while I run up and try to ask the question of the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good luck. Yeah. Well, the gentlewoman from Maine. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, for your answers. And, and I just, uh, uh, I, I guess I can't help myself. I want to mention something about sea level rise since you brought it up, our current Mr. Chair. Uh, and I really appreciate your willingness to focus on this, um, whether it's the tribes or other states. It, I guess I just have to say um, I'm happy to read the 2017 report. It is seven years, and a lot has changed. And I think um, maybe because you're in Montana, you don't see what I see in, in the, on the coast of Maine. Uh, so I'd be happy to invite you out anytime or anyone on the committee who'd like to take a look at this who has some concerns about whether or not this is real. And I don't know about glacial isostatic adjustment, but I'm going to learn all about it. Um, but I just want to tell you, this year we had two back-to-back -back severe storms. And I, I'm sure in 2017, nobody in my community, a fishing town 12 miles off the coast of Maine on an island, uh, thought there would ever be anything like we saw this year. Two back-to-back -back storms. We have a 180-year-old uh, boatyard, basically, in our district. In our little town of 400, everybody turned out between the first and the second storm because they were so worried that this building that's been there forever and the fishermen depend on was going to wash away. They had block and tackles and chains. They put cement blocks on the floor. They did everything they could possibly think of to try to hold it on land, to try to keep it there. And right now, we don't know if it'll survive. It got through that storm, it got through the second storm, but we're probably going to lose it. And you can come visit the coast of Maine and see up and down the coast of Maine, 150-year-old piers everywhere, communities like Stonington, Maine, fishing towns. They're washing away. This was a tide like we had never seen before in a storm surge from the southeast, which is weather we used to never have before. So you can say that there's some kind of tectonic plate shift going on, or this isn't really real, or whatever. But I invite you to come to my communities. These are fishermen. These are communities that are going to disappear, not to mention the tribal communities. I'm just talking about our fishing towns, our community piers. They're, they're going away. This tide, this tide is higher than we have ever imagined could happen to us, and it's, it's not even there yet. It's not even anywhere near what the maps say. Places that are peninsulas are going to turn into islands. Communities are losing their sewer systems, their infrastructure. It's all going away. So. It's, it's one thing to sit 
inland <laughs> in Montana, you've got mountains, you can run to the top, but we don't have those options. And however we want to describe why this is happening, I just want to thank you, Madam Secretary, and your department for putting this focus on, because this is extremely real to us. It's very emotional to us. It's the end of so many of our communities, and we don't know where we're going to get the money to deal with all this. We don't know how we're going to move to higher ground when there isn't higher ground, or, or it's already filled up. Our island communities, our coastal communities, this is really serious to us. So thank you for your attention to us. I, I thoroughly invite any, anyone from this committee come spend some time in my district and see the coast of Maine. We'd love to have you. Uh, but you're going you're gonna to see some tears in the eyes of fishermen and people, hardcore Republican conservatives who, who don't always vote for me, but they want to know what we're going to do about this. And I, I invite you to join us in, in doing that. Ranking member, if I could just say very quickly, um, Maine was one of the first places I visited when I um, came into this position Thank at Katy National Park. And, um, and so I, I just want you to know that we care deeply about every single community that is facing these issues. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's American traditions, the fishermen, and we equate that with, when we think about those fishermen, we think about your state. So um, it's, it's, it is heartbreaking when you think that these are lives of people that are getting washed away. And um, so we're doing everything we possibly can to address the issues. I, I thank you for that, and I thank you for visiting our state. Um, the, the challenge is, and I think this is what many of us saw this winter, that we never really had really had knowledge in this visceral way. This is so much bigger than any one of us. This is so much bigger than the budget that we have. This is so much bigger than our petty arguments about what's real and not real. You, you just got to come and see it to understand. Uh, and if it can happen twice this winter, you know, what's coming next year? Who knows? Okay, I'm going to completely change topics here. I want to talk about the Compact of Free Association, uh, which actually does involve some island communities, but of course, uh, a, a far cry from the Atlantic Ocean. I was really pleased to see that the second fiscal year 2024 Consolidated Appropriations Act included amendments to the Compact of Free Association. This allowed the United States to meet our commitments to freely associated states. The agreement will provide $6.5 billion of economic assistance over 20 years to the Federate States of Micronesia, the Republic of Marshall Islands, and Republic of Palau. So this is a major achievement, and I'm curious about how these funds will build on the previous successes of the investments we made. Um, can you tell me a little more? And I just want to say one exciting aspect of the agreement is that it restores eligibility for key federal public benefit programs for freely associated state individuals while they are lawfully present in the United States. Implementation is going to require a multi-agency effort by the federal government. Will the Office of Insular Affairs help coordinate it with other federal agencies like USDA and VA in order to leverage your expertise? And I've had a chance to communicate with uh, you know some of the principles in the country, so I know this is a pressing issue, and I just want to know how we can work together on this. Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much for your support. Um, this was a long time coming. It w took a lot of conversations, a lot of traveling, a lot of um, really uh, frank and um, in-depth um, roundtable conversations with um, people to get this done. Um, I was very honored to visit the Pacific, and I understand uh, what this means to them. Um, thank you for mentioning um, the citizens um, uh, lawfully residing in the U.S. issue. Um, the new law also provides um, access to benefits for U.S. military veterans who live in the freely associated states, and they can now receive the benefits they earned and rightfully deserve. Uh, the DOI is working with the Department of State and other agencies to thoughtfully implement these changes, and we will continue to work with interagency partners to ensure COFA implementation, including the changes in allowable benefits, is as successful as the negotiations. Uh, the initial work underway to ensure new funds are in place and appoint DOI's representatives to the interagency group for freely associated states and other implementation committees. So we are on this. Uh, it's a long time coming. Um, there were many hours of, of prayer and, <laughs> and everything else you can think of to get this across the finish line, and I know that uh, the freely associated states are very happy to have, to have it done. Yeah, well, congratulations on getting that done. I know it's been a long time coming, and I'm 
so happy to finally have meetings about how to implement it, not when will we ever get this done. So that's great. Um, that's it for me. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Secretary Holland, yes, uh, thanks again. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here and accommodate our questions. Uh, according to the National Park Service data, the Blue Ridge Parkway in Western North Carolina is unsurprisingly the most visited national park in 2023 with more than 16.7 million recreational visits. And it has consistently been among the most visited parks for the last two decades. Even better, if you follow the Blue Ridge Parkway to its southernmost end, it will bring you right into my district to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, and I wish the, uh, our senior chairman were here now because he was telling me the other day he thought that uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was in Tennessee, but it's also very much in North Carolina for the interest of uh, everyone in this room. In fact, it's about evenly split between Tennessee and, and North Carolina. Um, and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the third most visited national park in 2023, and yet another one of my district's greatest wonders. In both instances, the parkway and the park struggle with deferred maintenance and repair projects. And without asking for more money, uh, Madam Secretary, can you explain how the Department of Interior determines how much funding that each national park receives annually. Is it uh, formula-based or is there some other uh, process that you use to, to prioritize where the available funds are distributed? Thank you very much, Congressman. And I've been to both the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Great Smoky Mountains. And um, the Great Smoky Mountains from your state um, is adjacent to the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation. So yes. there's an entrance right there. And I saw some wild turkeys running around. It was very nice. Um, so I can give you an idea. Did you miss the elk? <laughs> I didn't see any elk. It, uh, we, we've uh, visit, we've replenished the elk population. You would uh, you'd really enjoy seeing that. Oh, too. excellent. Well, it is truly beautiful. And um, so in my travels, of course, you see um, that um, the funding that we give to national parks is well spent and it's needed and necessary and all of that. Um, so I can give you an idea of the type of funding um, parks in your area receive. Our fiscal year 2025 budget requests for annual appropriations include 20 million for Blue Ridge, 23.7 for Great Smoky Mountains, um, which is 1.5 million above 2023. Uh, also, through the Great American Outdoors Act Legacy Restoration Fund program, um, 185 million already received for multiple projects at Blue Ridge, 35 million to replace the Laurel Fork Bridge. Uh, work is underway. 150 million to reconstruct sections of the parkway. Work is underway, and 35 million to rehab park roads at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, of course, different parks require different types of funding or different levels of funding due to what their infrastructure needs are. And so um, we, um, I can't tell you how the whole, um, how everything is figured out. That's a, a, a question for the National Park Service Director. However, uh, we do um, take those under consideration and um, the park, the superintendents themselves um, make sure that we know exactly what is needed in each park and we respond accordingly as best we can. And, and so I gather from that, because there, there are a lot of needs, I, I gather from that there's no set formula that uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the old adage comes in, I'm, and I'm sure you've heard the squeaky wheel. Yes, I've heard that. M Meet the squeaky wheel. Indeed. All right. Well, we welcome, we welcome you to be the squeaky wheel. We welcome you to call us every day if you would like to and let us know how much you care about these, and um, we appreciate that. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I yield. Um, Thanks. So <clears throat> let's, let's talk about Indian country and the, 
when I was secretary, we established a multi-agency task force to address drug trafficking and Indian human trafficking. It was comprised of elements from your department, uh, BLM, U.S. Park Service, U.S. Park Police, FBI, BIA, and the idea was to augment and supplement in coordination with the tribes. The tribes requested it. We provided the service in coordination with the tribes to go after exactly what we talked about, drugs, human trafficking, where are the kids going? So when, and when you took office, you discontinued that even though it was incredibly successful in the numbers and the amount of fentanyl and drugs confiscated is not in dispute. Why? Congressman, I appreciate the question and I recognize that perhaps we have um, different leadership styles. I appreciate your service I'll to our country directly. as the was Secretary because, of the Interior. Because it was a Trump administration because almost everything the Trump administration did, you immediately ended, whether it was good or bad or indifferent. Mm, that's so not altogether why? true, honestly. That's, that's not true. We, were you aware um, you discontinued this? However, we uh, are. Ma Madam Secretary, were you aware that the task force was discontinued when you took office? I was not aware of the task force, um, your task force, uh, Congressman. However, we are working very hard to ensure that we are providing the necessary services you, to Indian you, Would country. you agree mm -hmm. that perhaps a task force that had the FBI, BIA, BLM, U.S. Park Service I really appreciate together, that. Do you, do you, would you agree that such a task force would be helpful to Indian nations? Uh, Congressman, would you like us to contact your office and I'm just asking you, do you think it would be helpful? Uh, I, th I Thank you. Yeah, you, you can't answer whether, whether a task force with multiple, multiple law enforcement agencies in coordination with Indian country wouldn't be helpful in addressing some of the issue about drug trafficking, child traffic, indigenous personnel missing Thank or you. killed. I, I truly do appreciate that suggestion, Congressman, and, and we appreciate it. Well, let me, uh, first of all, you know, the science is the same in Maine as it is in Montana. And I follow the science. I always have. So sometimes you look at it, and the science, for those that have read the 2017 multi-agency Department of Interior Climate Change Report, there's 200 models, 1,000 variables. So some people that don't look at science manipulate those variables for an outcome. That's not science. The science was saying Glacier Park, which the glaciers are melting, absolutely. I've been on the glaciers, eating lunch. I've witnessed the recede of the glacier. It started 10,000 years ago. Sea level rise has been the same for about 7,000 years, more or less. Hurricanes, the frequency. Madam Secretary, are you, are you aware uh, that the frequencies of hurricanes has neither increased nor decreased in frequency a number of times in the last 400 years? Um, I, every time a hurricane happens, um, are you are you are you aware that the frequency has gone up or down, or do you believe it has? I'm just, I'm just curious. I believe that the storms have gotten more intense, stronger storms than I will give you that data, before. and it's science. So do I agree that, that erosion and tides have an enormous effect on Maine and, the, and its beautiful coastline? Absolutely. Do I, do I think that our older buildings are, are at risk? Because it is changing. And should we address them? Yeah, because there, there's buildings and structures that are absolutely worth saving in this country. And tradition is part of it. So I'll work with you, but uh, science is science, and science is the same in the great state of Maine as in Montana. So with that, thank you, Madam Secretary. And thank if you, you would, uh, I am going to scrutinize your, your legal department to see where you're spending. I think having to, having to get a Major League Baseball team at $500,000 to spend money over, over a logo that has twice, twice been ruled by the governing authority not to be a logo infringement, I think is atrocious. 
And unless I was sitting here, I don't think you would know it. And that's a mistake of us all. So, um, Madam, do you have anything further? No, thank you. And we, but thank you for, for thank appearing. You. Thank you. Thank you for all taking the time to join us this morning. We look forward to being with you over the common months. Uh, questions have been, have been no doubt delivered, and we would appreciate an answer in, in a timely fashion. This committee stands adjourned. Good to see you, Denise.